Hey girl, welcome to On My Mark, your weekly transformational podcast designed to motivate, empower and inspire to aspire. Yes, in that order. I am your host, Ravimbo C, and I'm a speaker by passion, philanthropist by purpose and a Zimbabwean by tradition. I want to let you in on a little secret. This isn't your typical motivational podcast. This right here is transformational. So join me every Tuesday for your weekly dosage of inspiration. Hey girl and welcome to the final episode of our very special edition of Unspoken. Listen, this season has been I don't even what's the what's the word this season has been very eye-opening, if I could say the least, because some of the stories that we've heard from the young people that will come on here have been shocking, um, have been eye-opening, and they've definitely started a lot of conversations uh, behind the scenes, which I've been having with so many other young women who've then come forward and shared you know, their stories with me of things that they have been through. Um, So once again, I just really want to thank every single young woman that has come on the show and share their story. And I really want to thank all the listeners as well and people that have got involved online and on emails uh, with your questions and, you know, with your suggestions. Uh, I'm definitely very appreciative of, of you all. Now, as I mentioned last episode that this week we have two special guests for you not one but two special guests so I'm gonna I'm about to bring on our first special guest now remember what I said um I really felt like it was important if we could have professionals come on to sort of close off the show because we've been talking and discussing quite a lot of um on quite a lot of topics that are very sensitive and I really thought it was very important to just have a professional perspective and you know on some of the topics that we've been dealing with on Unspoken. So coming on first right this is a very special lady I hope you guys are excited as I am. So coming on first we've got a a psychotherapist her name is Lorraine Collins and she's a cognitive behavioral therapist and she's also the founder of Wellness and Works. So she's about to come on and enlighten us on some of the issues that we have been touching on. Hi, Lorraine. Can you hear me? Hi, Ravinda. Hi. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Brilliant. How are you? How are you today? You know, I'm good. I'm good. I am in a good space. I've, uh, yeah, I've landed into the day gently just by doing the things that I, yeah, you know, that I need to do that are non-negotiable that hopefully I'll talk about a little bit later on. So yeah, I'm in a good space at the moment. Yeah. That's so, great. Yeah. Lisa, we're so happy to have you on here. And I know because I've been hinting over the past few weeks that I've got a special surprise for you guys. Oh. I've got a special <laughs> surprise for you guys. So, you know, it's finally great to have you on the show. And I just want us to get right, right into it because um I've got questions. The girls have got questions. We've got questions that we feel like some of the questions that we have, you might be able to enlighten us and we can have a little discussion on, you know, some of the topics that we have uh, been dealing with throughout the throughout the season. So, um, Lorraine, I just wanted to ask, I don't know, actually, before I ask my questions, um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what it is exactly that you do? Yeah, of course. I mean, first of all, it's a, you know, it's a privilege to be here. I'm, I, um, I'm always interested in uh, people who want to open a conversation about well-being and how we can better take care of ourselves. I think that it's a real important factor in how we move forward from trauma and just kind of self-defeating behaviours. So, um yeah, I just want to kind of shine a light on you. I think it's great work that you're doing. So, you know, what yeah. what do I do? I'm a psychotherapist, I'm a cognitive behavioural therapist, and I'm a counsellor as well. Um, I've trained in analytic theory, um, and I, I'm also the founder of an initiative called Wellness at Work, and that's not just about wellness at work, it's wellness at and in everything. So it started as a response to lockdown. I was working one night quite late in my practice. I was the only person in my building, and 
you know, it was quite isolating. Um, my practice is in the middle of town and there were very little, you know, kind of not many people around at that at that uh, at that time as you can imagine and um and I remember it was about seven o'clock in the evening and I went to the window just to stretch my legs and I could see a figure from across the building across the square and I think it was a man it was the silhouette of a man and he came to the window and he waved at me and I waved back and in that moment, there was this sense of connectedness. You know, we were having our own individual experience. We were alone. But in that moment, we were together. It was a shared experience. And from that moment, I, I thought to myself, I want to do something after all this is done. And we're, we're able to kind of get out and be together. And so wellness at work was um, kind of seeded in that moment. And I I go into companies and just ask and inquire and and ask them to kind of share their experiences on how they take care of their staff and what practices they do and can share with others. It's kind of divergent thinking. So it's like companies that wouldn't usually work together, work together so that there's a more kind of uh, blended sense of community. And I think that this is what we really need now, you know, mm-hmm. sharing our experience, our strength, our hope in order for us to kind of move forward because collectively we're, we're, we're more powerful than than doing it on our own. No, that's amazing. That is <laughs> such an amazing profile. And um, I really loved um, what you're gravitating towards, especially wellness with like at work and, you know, outside of work as well. Because um, when we were having conversation, I mean, some of the girls that came on and, and shared their stories, uh, one of the common things that they they, they, they spoke about is that they didn't have a sense of self you know they felt like they they got lost in the world or they got lost in the experiences they were going through and um, they were just sort of just going by so I really just I want to ask actually because you spoke about you know wellness and, and self-care I want to ask you um, how important is self-care and taking time out for yourself when it comes to your well-being okay um so wellness and well-being is I mean it's great that we're talking about this that there is a conversation that is kind of opening up more and more but um, I have to be honest um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is what are people actually doing so that it goes beyond a platitude and a kind of Instagram meme Mm -hmm. Um, because for me wellness means you know more than just in kind of going to the spa that's great but it's it's a practice that encompasses and this is my own experience so many aspects so for me that's not just what I'm putting in my body but it's what I'm thinking about it's what I'm choosing to surround myself around um it's basically the relationship with myself. So how am I treating myself today? And, you know, before you asked me, you know, how am I doing? And I said, I, I've landed into the day gently. And that's because I start my day with non-negotiables. And that is, I like to write a few pages. I like to do a gratitude list in the morning just to center myself. I like to make sure that I kind of check in and ask myself, you know, so how am I feeling? Um, it's basically a self-reflective practice and that means that I'm more attuned to what's going on inside. And when I'm more attuned to what's going on inside, I'm more able to make certain choices about the next step that I'm going to take outside in the world. It creates that pause. And I love that that acronym for pause, you know. Um, so it's kind of uh, postpone action until serenity evolves you know and mm. uh, and and so this is as, as just as important as going to the gym or go or brushing my teeth that I, I create space in the morning to create well-being that's something that um that I don't shift away from oh but I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna say also that sometimes um you know life happens and we're not able to kind of do the things that we want to do. Like we're not able to, you know, write some pages in the morning or do some of the things. And that's okay. The, 
the thing is, is to, to approach it with the intention. And it might be that you just, you know, just have five minutes of, you know, just that internal inquiry because mm -hmm. you've got to be somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. and, and life happens. But it's sending that intention and doing something. And it might not be at the beginning of the day, but you can do it during the day as well. That is so amazing. There's something that you mentioned. You, you, you spoke about self-reflective practice. Is this something that you do daily? You don't have to sit there for an hour. It can be mm. just a few minutes in the morning to check in. Because what I find is I wake up sometimes offline. So, you know, you can get those whirling thoughts. Oh, my goodness, the sinking feeling. Oh, another day. How am I going to do that? Blah, 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 blah. That can kind of send you in a spiral of hooping, looping thoughts. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of rein myself back in, I ask myself in a soft voice, what is it that I need today? How am I going to treat myself today? What are the things that I might need and at the end of the day, just before I get into bed, I'll do another kind of inventory check. And that inventory check is just reviewing my day of some of the things that happened that were challenging, that may have been triggering, so that there's an acknowledgement of some of the areas in that day that yeah. were, you know, that, that I found difficult. So I don't just kind of brush it under the carpet and go to bed, that there is a witnessing and an honouring of that and saying, you know what? Yeah, I saw, I see you, I hear you. And you become your best friend. So that's the reason why I do this self-reflective practice, because it's about becoming your own best friend, if you like. That's, mm -hmm. that's the way I see it and not self-abandoning. Thank you so much for what you've just shared. I really loved what you said about becoming your your best friend. And, you know, you, you have quite a self-reflective practice. And that is just so amazing because as you were speaking, I was actually reflecting on my own life. And I was thinking, gosh, girl, when was the last time you checked in on yourself and actually mm -hmm. were intentional about your day or your plans or where you're at with, with your life? And I just think it's so important what you mentioned about having conversations with yourself because in in each and every one of us, I believe we have the ability to actually check in on ourselves, you know, to to check where you're at, to ask yourself, you know, how you're doing, you know, pick yourself up because at times you're not always going to have people around you, you know, to, 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 to pick you up. So I really, really love what you've just mentioned about becoming your own best friend because I feel like a lot of... Um, a lot of young women are remaining in uncomfortable situations because they are then afraid of, you know, the effects that it's going to have on their family instead of yeah. actually then thinking about themselves and their own well-being. Okay. So, you know, I just, we, I've got two more questions to ask you actually before we, before we round up. I know because of our time, but we just want you here. Like we just want to keep going on and on well, and on. No. I would love to come back. I think this, is, this is this is a conversation. I'm sorry, as I'm talking, I've got a siren going on in the back. I think that's a kind of a sign to say this is an important conversation that needs to carry on. We need to carry on this conversation. No, honestly, you know, it, it's so expansive, isn't it? No, we do. And, you know, we do need to carry on this conversation. But I wanted to also ask you that what else can we do? You know, what else do you think we can do besides raising an awareness uh, for these kind of issues that young women are facing? What else can can be done? Do you think um, it's more of a internal thing or do you think other people, the society can do more in terms of, you know, actually helping young women who are going through traumas, abuse, um, addiction and stuff like that? Yeah, well, it's about, you know, practical sh strategies, actions that, that move them from a place of being powerless into a place of feeling empowered, you know. So you, you compost all that hurt, all that shame, you compost it and you make it fertile so that you grow new shoots and you rise up out of that. And so... You know, there are so many organisations, but it's about doing the work. It's about being invested in your, and I say recovery because it's a process of recovering yourself. And that's what I mean by that. Um, so it's about taking action and finding out where the resources are and where the, the support groups are and speaking up to people that you feel safe to speak to. Mm. I mean, I like to think of it as like 
you know, going to, uh, you wouldn't go to the hardware store to buy bread. So, you know, you have to be discerning about who you're choosing to share your stuff with, you know, Mm. find yourself a therapist, find someone that you can just have that kind of contact, that new attachment where you feel that, okay, I'm going to share what's going on. And this is a safe space and I'm going to feel held and contained. And it just develops a muscle of trust. It develops a muscle of doing the opposite of what your head might be telling you to do, which is don't say anything. It'll get better. You know, just just carry on. Just carry on. Just carry on. No, 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 no. You want to do the opposite of that and you want to give yourself a chance by going in another direction, a direction that gives you more opportunities and expansion of your life, because that's what we all deserve. It's our birthright. Mm. I mean, I'm available to speak to to people if they want to just have an ear. Um, My capacity at the moment is limited, but I can certainly signpost people or I'll never, you know, kind of turn people away if they really want to chat. You've got my details. No, wow, wow. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Listen, like we we're gonna have to have you back, honestly. <laughs> we're gonna have to have you back because I feel like we're just we were just warming up. We were just warming up. No, but thank you so much. Uh we really appreciate you coming on the show and um everything that you you've you've shared with us. Um I know you said that um you know we, there's other organizations and places that you can refer people to but for anyone listening that might want to follow you or send you a message um where's the best place to to to, to get hold of you um okay so i'm on insta but i'm if people want to contact me via you know lorraine's collins counseling um on insta lorraine's lorraine collins therapy or wellness at work dot world wellness at work dot world because i'm always uploading strategies and tips to develop a self-care practice self-reflection practice um signposting people to places that they can just again land gently that we, we need to create more community where we feel held heard and understood and i'm all about that so if anybody wants to reach out um and needs you know just a safe space then i i'm 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 here to to be of service for that. And and of course, in in absolute confidentiality as well, because I think that's the other thing. I think people um, are are scared uh, because, you know, it's like, oh, gosh, is this this safe? You know, it's what, you know, fear of retribution and all that kind of stuff. So um, and it's understandable. You know, I've, I've been there, so I totally understand. I get it. Thank you so much, Lorraine. You're so welcome. It's been amazing having you on the show and we definitely look forward to having you back. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an absolute honour to be here. Privilege. Okay, so moving on up next, I mean, we've just had Lorraine and she was just amazing in everything that she's she spoke about about well-being and wellness and checking on yourself i hope we all had our pen and our pads because i definitely do so we got our next guest now now we've got dr joyline gojo now she is a psychotherapist and a lecturer she lectures on the master's degree in psychotherapy course at the Birkbrook university of london and she also has a private practice now she's been a psychotherapist for the past 13 years and has extensive experience in the mental health field. Uh, so we are so excited to have her on and on my mark. Dr. Joyline, can you hear us? Hi, remember, I'm here. Oh, I brilliant. can hear you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Honestly, um, I've been creating so much hype and excitement. I kept telling everyone, listen, I've got special guests coming. I've got special guests coming. So it's just so amazing to, to finally have you on, on this special edition of Unspoken with On My Mark. So thank you so, so much. Um, how's your day today? Let's start from there. How's your day going? Um, my day has been well, and I should say, uh, my pleasure being here, and thank you for inviting me to your platform. No, brilliant. No, honestly, the, the 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 pleasure is all ours. I mean, I've just gave a brief, you know, introduction about yourself, but do you do you mind explaining a bit more to us about what exactly it is that that you do within your field of expertise as a doctor? <laughs> 
Um, so I am a psychotherapist, as you said, and um, I worked in the mental health field before I did my psychotherapy training. And I then did my PhD and I teach on the uh, psychotherapy course at Birkbeck University of London. And alongside that, I have a private practice and I see, I mean, I would say most of my clients are people from minoritized backgrounds. Okay. So that, that's kind of my background, uh, so to speak, professionally. Okay, nice. Um, so I've done a, I've done a, you know, I've had a look at your profile and I've done a bit of research on you. And I saw that, you know, some of you, you've dealt with a lot of clients that have come to you. Um, you know, you're quite experienced in people that, you know, have been through traumas. Now, um, throughout this season, we had uh, one of the young women came on here and, you know, she was explaining to us what she went through as a, as, as a child. And she also mentioned that she's found that uh, what she went through as a child is now affecting her her, her relationships um, a, as a young adult. So I wanted to then ask you, can childhood traumas affect you um, as an adult? Okay, so I think maybe the, the important thing is to perhaps define what is trauma. Uh. And I always like to use the word, the phrase adverse childhood experiences because people always think that Trauma means someone gets hit by a car or they, you know, they have this major accident, but we don't recognize that all these experiences we have in childhood, as small, as benign as they are, um, the impact of that on the child at an emotional level, it's quite traumatic for, for example, a child who loses their parents or who goes through abuse or who has a disrupted home, home oh. life or someone who's bullied in childhood, someone who may have had extensive loss of friendships or maybe parents or loved ones, or has to relocate so many times, and there's an attachment uh, trauma there. So, uh -huh. I mean, if we think about it from a um, from the perspective of that going through, you know, that experience being something that a child is going through, uh, they are unsophisticated to make sense of it or process it at an emotional level. So you find that all these experiences, they're the building blocks of who we are as adults. So if there's been a lot of trauma, as I said, the traumas is not just the big T traumas where you get run over by a car, uh -huh. but these adverse childhood experiences are also considered in clusters as traumas because they have an emotional impact on uh -huh. the child. So a lot of these things that happens in childhood, we don't recognize the significance of them and how they shape us as adults, unless if we interrogate them. And a lot of people come to therapy unaware of it. Uh. And as soon as they start doing the work, they then recognize, oh, my gosh, yes, this was traumatic. Uh -huh. My parents' relationship, as dysfunctional as it was, it wasn't happening to just them as parents, but it also happens to me. It also happened to me because I was a witness to it. I was a part of the family. My parents divorce or the abuse or maybe physical, it may be sexual, uh. whatever it is. I mean, the most important thing is understanding that the child has no capacity to make sense or process emotions at that level. It's such a, uh. you know, this complex emotion. So they are internalized. So this is how in, child, in adulthood, anyone who may have experienced trauma a lot of them, they really struggle with either relationship with other people or relationship with themselves. The sense, you know, poor sense, self, you know, um, things like low self-esteem, poor self-image, lack of self-belief, and doubting oneself, or maybe just identity issues, not understanding who am I, why, where do I end up this person, yet there's so much happening around me. Uh -huh. And there's also the other side where relational from a relational perspective, people really do struggle with relating because with others if they've had a lot of trauma because there's a lot about the adults during that time in their lives when they're children who failed the child. So we lack trust in, in the world and we lack trust in the adults. But unless we forget to understand that and work through it and process it and make sense of it and integrate that trauma into our lives, it always becomes these things that haunt us. And we don't understand why, for example, as I said, we can't have healthy relationships. We become addicted. 
to substances is to numb something that's there, isn't it, and emotionally. Mm. There is a pain that, that needs to be um, understood and made sense of. And some people may find themselves, um, I mean, there could be so many different things, but unless one is really ready to confront themselves and understand what my childhood was like, how did all these things that I went through in childhood shape me as an adult? Why do I become this adult who has ABC kind of issues? Mm-hmm. And sometimes the trauma is very hidden. It's very insidious. Things that may seem very small, very benign, very um, um, very, very, very insignificant. They are significant because the child has not um, got that level of sophistication of making sense of the world and, mm-hmm. and in the way that the adult does. So being compassionate to the child that we were once upon a time is necessary and is really mm-hmm. important. I've also worked with a lot of people who come to therapy and they present with these issues that always takes back, you know, relates to their you know, childhood trauma, adverse childhood experiences that have never been interrogated. And only when they come to therapy, they start doing the work. So I hope that answers your question. I'm sorry for being long-winded, but I hope it also reflects on the level of passion that I have on this topic and why I'm a psychotherapist to start with. No, thank you so much for that. Um, You actually mentioned uh, a few things that I've heard people say, but it's different when you actually hear it. from, from a professional because you you, you mentioned um, attachment trauma and um, I heard a lot of people say sometimes they feel like they end up in unhealthy relationships um, you know they, they've got attachment problems and when they look back they say they believe maybe they are that way because um, they were neglected as a child or they went through um, you know they went through something as a child and they have this void now that they're trying to to feel mm-hmm. um, as, as, as an adult um, so it, 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 it's really insightful that, you know, you're actually bringing this to us. And um, one of the things that you mentioned was, you know, it's important to to integrate the trauma and to confront some of these things that you that you've been through um, as, a, as a child. So mm-hmm. uh, therapy is the best way to sort of confront um, these things. Mm-hmm. Or- uh, would you say that's the best thing? Because, you know, it's not always, I can imagine it's not always easy to sort of like confront your past, you know, some mm-hmm. people uh, close off their past. Some people don't want to remember um, mm-hmm. they've been through. So would you say having someone like a therapist help mm-hmm. with concentration is is the best way to go? Well, I think your, your question is maybe um, something that reflects um, what's happening at the moment, for example, in the NHS and in kind of the wider public worldwide, even the U S I've got to know and understand that there is also this kind of um, gap in terms of people who are prescribed psychotherapy in comparison to people who are prescribed medication. Mm. Um, I, I'm my psychotherapist for a reason because I believe medication helps, but it has its part. Mm. So if I use the metaphor of a house that's burning, uh, for example, let's have someone who has um, anxiety and they have panic attacks or, you know, they're really struggling with, with their everyday life. They may have had a trauma in the past. If you prescribe medication, it helps them to kind of calm the nerves down. It helps them to, you know, helps them to regulate in the moment. But it doesn't really go back to addressing the root cause of that. Uh-huh. Same as with the depression. People who may be depressed and they're prescribed uh, antidepressants, it helps them. However, my point is that um, we need to also consider that medication is helpful. Um, let's not forget that there is also the need to go into understanding the root cause of these um, issues that people have with depression, anxiety, it could be addictions, it could be sometimes even personality disorders, we don't just become adults with these issues. It's really important that we look into ourselves, have an inward journey, have a relationship with yourself, an introspection. And this is where therapy uh, takes us. This is what it's about, is working through and, of course, integrating and processing emotionally and integrating these adverse experiences that at times we don't think about them. So I was using the metaphor of a house on fire because if there is a house that's on fire, uh-huh. you don't just put out the fire and walk away, do you? 
that no you you want to find out the cause of the fire you want to co- find out the cause of the fire so if you think about medication itself as this kind of putting the house down you know the fire down you just walk away because you've got the fire you know put the fire the flames out are you really doing a self a service um because the fire may come up again and you don't know what's causing the fire to start with so this is where therapy is akin to really investigating what's the source of this fire Mm. where is the fuse and how is it you know are there any wires that are what is happening what's causing this fire but that's when the relationship with the therapist is key to making you know first of all to any kind of successful therapy because one has to feel safe and held by the therapist that was that I really took in a lot from what you said. And, you know, one of the things that really stood up to me was the metaphor that you gave us of a burning house. And you said medication is helpful, but understanding the root cause of these things um, is, is what you need to, to, to really do, you know, because we don't mm-hmm. become adults with these things. It's a journey. And, you know, there are things that you can, these are things that, you know, you can work through having conversations with yourself and really understanding, you know, the mm-hmm. root so I think that was very very powerful um mm-hmm. and, and thank you so much for that listen uh, we would love to just stay here and, and you know and and hear more from you hear more from you um but before you go I really wanted to ask like what would what what's your uh you know because obviously with unspoken we had these courageous women that came forward and you know shared their unspoken stories but there mm-hmm. are many others that feel like they don't have a voice you know mm-hmm. to Sort of speak up about things that they've been through or things you know that they are going through so what would your advice what would your advice be you know to that young woman out there who feels like she doesn't have a voice mm-hmm. well I think if we, our voice is muted then how do we get heard by others how do we mm-hmm. you know you know speak up for ourselves how do we advocate for ourselves if we can't say what's on our minds, share our thoughts, share our feelings. I think what I find is that a lot of people struggle talking with their friends or families, especially if they've been through a lot of trauma, because A, there's shame, B, there's also stigma, and they also tend to want to protect the families or the people who've hurt them. It's only normal. Mm -hmm. And we know that when one has gone through abuse, they also have this relationship, quite a perverse relationship with the abuser where they want to protect the abuser mm-hmm. and are undermining their own feelings. So mm-hmm. there's a lot about that. But of a lot of people I've worked with who for the very first time come into therapy, they've been able to talk about a lot of issues around sexual abuse, especially or um, incest in families and at times not just sexual but abuse of all kinds of nature uh, especially in these minority communities um, where it's not spoken about, it's not <laughs> even mentioned, and the churches are places where a lot of people go to, instead of them being safe spaces, they, again, there's a repetition of this trauma, this abuse, where people who are supposed to be in trusting positions of power and authority, again, use these young women and men in an abusive manner, and then there's a break, you know, <laughs> break of trust completely in oneself and in the world. Mm. So you find that a lot of people who come to therapy, they find their voice only if the validation that they get from having an adult who they can trust, who can hear their story in a safe space, and they can talk about it and not feel ashamed to talk about it and want to share it with, you know, in, great detail at an emotional level this is what I went through and this is my experience one is acknowledging and this is how it made me feel and it's not fair Mm -hmm. being able to just say that out loud and hearing you say it out this is such a powerful experience and there's a huge trust just confronting and acknowledge that thanks to confronting oneself and acknowledging that it's incredibly transformative you find that a lot of people once they get to that place where they can talk about it in therapy, their the voice get louder and louder. They get more confident in, in believing in themselves that this is me and my boundary is was crossed. And when we have a boundary, we can also recognize when it's been breached, when <laughs> other people get into our space and they uh, abuse as a breach of boundary, right? Mm. So 
they can then confront sometimes they do have the voice to talk about their stories in ways that they may never have done. Sometimes they even confront the abusers or share with their parents or with their family members who may never have known about it because they develop that you know strong voice and sense of self and belief in oneself and they trust their, their feelings that it's not fair and they understand it at, at an adult level because they were children. Mm-hmm. So when it happened, they were children, but now they can recognize and acknowledge that actually that child didn't have a voice, but I'm an adult now and I have a right to speak up for myself. I can advocate for myself and I can talk about this and and it's my experience and it's valid and it deserves to be heard. So this is where therapy itself is hugely significant and I am actually going to start running some groups where women can come in and talk about it in a safe, contained space and share process um, if they can do individual therapy, which I advocate for anyone out there who's listening who may have you know, shied away from therapy because they didn't understand how it works or maybe they were uninformed or maybe the suspiciousness around it or lack of trust in themselves that go to therapy. Mm. that's the only thing that you can do for yourself that you never regret in life. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question, Rimbo. No, it, it really does. I mean, that was so powerful what you said. You you know, you said that if, if your voice is muted, how do you speak up for yourself? How do mm-hmm. you speak up for yourself? You know, we need to find that safe place and confront yourself. Let your mm-hmm. voice get louder and, mm-hmm. and louder. So, oh, my God, yes. Yes, I've definitely taken that in. And I feel like a lot of the listeners out there really needed to hear that. Because mm-hmm. A lot of us have just, you know, shied away. We've we've lost ourselves. We've lost our voices. And we've just accepted that, you know, mm-hmm. this is the way it is. And this is the way it's always going to be. But it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be that way, you know. You no. know, it does not have to be that way. So, listen, thank you so much, Dr. Joyline. I mean, if they're like, where can we find you? Like, if there are people listening right now and they want to check you out, they want to see what you do, uh, <laughs> what is the best platform to find you? <laughs> so, yes, my name is Joyline, uh, Dr. Joyline Gaza. Um, I have um, my own website, personal website. I have other platforms and different um Kind of directories have some information about my work and and what I do. and I also have a Twitter account and a new Instagram account. So if you want to follow me on Instagram or Twitter, do that. And I like to be interactive. It's lovely to 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 have spoken to you, remember, and your audience in this way and reach out. And um, my pleasure being here. No, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for for being here. Thank you so much for sharing us with your your knowledge with us. I feel like we're going to have to invite you back another time because we just want to hear more and more. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Doctor Jolene. So yes, hey girl, that was our two special guests. I hope you guys have have taken it in. I hope you've enjoyed it, and um, I really hope that this is something that we can continue. So with that said, hey girl. See you on season four. Join us again next week as we continue to transform and win. Be sure to subscribe on our website on mymark.co for weekly exclusives and giveaways. Until next time, on my mark, get set, let's go. Let's go.